All right, well, so far, uh, as we've been looking through the book of Romans, and remember Paul here is explaining the gospel to the church at Rome, which he personally had not yet visited. This church was started by a group of converted Jews from the day of Pentecost, and we know by this time it, they had been evangelizing the Gentiles, and so there were Jews and Gentiles in the congregation. Uh, I'm beginning to think that they were primarily Jews rather than Gentiles because of all the different objections that Paul keeps addressing of the Jews. And we're going to see this continuing, I think, all the way through chapter 11, perhaps to the end of the book. But anyway, we want to, each time we come to a new chapter, remember where we are in the argument and what it is that Paul has shown us. And so I'm going to review each of the chapters very briefly. So don't tune out if you hear something familiar, okay? <laughs> Let it just provoke in your mind, again, the thoughts that, that we had as we were looking through these books. Now, Paul began by arguing that no one has an excuse for their disobedience. Not the Gentiles, because they have God's revelation in nature, nor the Jews, who have His special revelation in Scripture. All of us know what God wants, but we all choose to disobey Him. At least we do apart from His grace, apart from His help. So Paul says we're all guilty. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are going to see heaven on our own. God will not accept us. So, if we are ever to reach heaven, He must provide the way. And of course, the good news that Paul's expounding here is that he has, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through His obedience, through His death on the cross, and He offers to it to us freely, the work, you know, the benefits of what Jesus did. If we will only believe... If we will only trust in him. Now he went on in chapter 4 to tell us that this was how Abraham was justified. How he was accepted by God. It wasn't because he was an obedient servant. It wasn't because of his circumcision. Again, two things which the Jews would look at. But because he believed. Abraham, or excuse me, Paul writes, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. That is very key to what Paul is speaking about in Romans. Now, what does he mean by that? What he means is that Abraham looked forward through the promises that God gave to him, particularly that promise of, of the seed through whom all the nations would be blessed. And he trusted in that coming seed. And he received the righteousness of that seed. Abraham was not justified because he did a good work by believing God's promises, but because in believing the promise to send the Messiah, he trusted in the Messiah, and he was saved through his righteousness. Now, Paul told us in, in Romans chapter 5 that when we believe, we also receive that righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. God accepts us in him, and in Christ he gives us benefits. Uh, our war with God has ended, and now we have peace because now we love each other, you know, instead of being at enmity toward each other. We no longer fall short of, of the glory of God. We no longer fall short of heaven, but now we have the hope that we will see heaven. He begins to use the difficulties that we have to face for our good, just like we just sang in, in the hymn, uh, the second hymn, Thy way, not mine, O Lord. Because God uses those things to work His character in us, particularly steadfast patience. And that proves to us that we really do belong to Him. Now, Paul strengthened that hope even further by arguing this, and I hope we can, you know, we can get the, the, the force of this argument. He says, if God was willing to reconcile us by giving to us His Son to die for us while we were His enemies... How much more now that he has reconciled us to himself, will he keep us through the life of his son who has been raised from the dead now to intercede for us? Ah, if, he would, if he would, again, give that which is most precious, that which is of infinite value for us while enemies, how much more will he hold on to us now that we are his friends, now that we are his children? So he concluded by saying, though Adam condemned us through his disobedience, through his one act of disobedience when he represented us in the garden, 
Jesus justified us. He saved us. He saved all who trust in him through his one act of obedience, his offering himself on the cross. Now, last week, Paul ended chapter 5 by explaining why God gave the law. Again, that would be the question raised by the Jews. If, uh, if we're not saved by the law, then why did God give it to us? Well, Paul said, and he's been arguing, it wasn't so that we could make ourselves acceptable to him. That by being good enough, God would, would receive us as his children, which is the way the Jews thought. But rather, he gave the law to us to show us how unacceptable we are. He wanted us to see our sins more clearly so that we would see how much we need His grace, so that we would receive His grace by trusting in His Son, and that so that He might glorify His grace, that He might make His grace to appear all the more glorious by saving those who deserve just the opposite. Now this morning, as I've already mentioned, Paul answers two objections that the Jews raised against that very thing. First, if God glorifies His grace, if He magnifies His grace and makes it look all the more glorious through our sins, by forgiving our sins, then why don't we just sin more so that He can receive more glory? Well, some people think that way. And secondly, he answers the objection, if we're no longer under the law to be justified but under grace, then does it really matter how we live? Okay, well, Paul answers these two questions, beginning with the first one. If God glorifies His grace through our sins, if, if our sinning gives Him the opportunity to show grace and to you know, make it more you know, obvious uh, for everybody to see so that we can honor Him for it, then why don't we sin more so that He can glorify Himself more? Well, Paul reacts to that idea in the strongest possible way. Verse 2, may it never be. And again, may it never come into existence. Don't even think that way. That's not the way things work. Well, how does it work? He says, how shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Now, Paul is going to go on to argue that we are, in fact, dead to sin, but alive to God. And what he does is he begins by pointing to something. I know we always struggle with this passage because it's talking about baptism. And we know baptism does not bring this about, but what, what does he mean? Well, he points to our baptism to make this argument that we're dead because this is what baptism actually teaches us. He says in verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, what is Paul talking about here? Is he talking about water baptism or is he talking about spirit baptism? Well, I think what he's talking about is the water baptism that is a, a picture of spirit baptism, which is what actually brings us about. Baptism is meant to teach us this very thing. Now, Jesus, remember, commanded um, in the Great Commission that all who believe in him should be baptized. He says in Matthew 28, 19, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, why? Why does he want us to be baptized? Well, the reason was that it might teach us several things. First, that we belong to God. Okay? That is his mark of ownership. And because we belong to him, because he has set us apart from the world to himself, it calls us to live in a particular way. Now, Paul is going to go on to tell us what that way is. But secondly, it teaches us, it reminds us that we have been washed, we have been cleansed of our sins by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Remember, the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit is essentially the Spirit applying Jesus to us, taking away our guilt, taking away, also breaking the power of sin, I should say. But it reminds us that having been washed, we no longer have to be afraid of judgment because we have been cleansed through Jesus. But for our purpose this morning, he also gave it to us to remind us that we are united with Christ, that we are in Christ, that all that he has done, all the benefits of this belong to us. 
Now, we often hear that his death, his atoning death, was vicarious, and it was. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in our place. Okay? He took our sins, our guilt, and he died uh, the death that we deserve to die in order to set us free from God's judgment. But we often miss the fact that his entire life was vicarious. Okay, when he lived, he lived for us. When he died, he died for us. When he rose and descended, he did this for us in order that he might guarantee the blessing of salvation for us. Jesus is our guarantee. He's the one who uh, is our surety, the way the confession puts it, our guarantor, the one who makes certain that everything God promises will be ours if we simply trust in him. Now, what Paul is telling us, though, in our text is something we probably never think about. And that is that this union also means that what he went through, we went through with him. When he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And when he was raised, we were raised with him. Now, when Paul points to our baptism, again, he's not saying water baptism is what brings us about. But what he is saying is this, that what it pictures is what brought it about. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. And what it means is the Spirit of God in this baptism it doesn't necessarily take place when water baptism takes place. It most often takes place before water baptism takes place, but sometimes it takes place at the same time or after, as our confession reminds us. But that baptism of the Spirit is what puts us in Christ. It, it is really what makes us alive and what makes us able to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also unites us to Him in every possible way. Unites us with His life, unites us uh, you might say there's a legal bond between us and Christ so that everything he has earned, he has earned for us. But there is also this, this bond, I'm not sure what we should call it, vicarious bond, where whatever Jesus went through, we, are, we went through it with him because of our union with him. Now, it's based on this that Paul begins to draw some implications. He says, first of all, if we died and were buried with Christ then we are no longer the slaves of sin. He says in verse 7, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now what he means here is the old self, the old man, the flesh, the sin nature, that part of us which I hope we understand is bad and we hate it, that part of it was put to death. The word does mean it was destroyed. Done away with on the cross, so that we are no longer its slaves. We are now free. Free. Now, that's going to raise some questions, isn't it? If, if the old man was destroyed, if sin was destroyed on the cross, if we died on the cross, then why do we still have to struggle with sin? Or do true believers actually have to struggle with sin? You know, is Paul teaching us here that the struggle is over, the warfare is ended, now it's just going to be easy from here on out? No. That's not what he's saying, and we're going to see that through the rest of this chapter. But it does mean, at the very least, that we no longer have to obey sin. Now, secondly, we not only died with him, but we are also raised with him. Now, that means a couple of things. First of all, it means that we will never die again, and that's good news. Remember what Jesus said to Martha in John 11, verse 26? Everyone who lives and believes in me, will never die. And what that means is that um, once we have, um, uh, you know, been raised to death or raised to life uh, spiritually, that we are never going to return to that same state of death that we were in before. We are forever alive. And certainly that also means on the day of resurrection, the Lord will raise us unto life. But in that spiritual resurrection, we also now have power to live a new kind of life, a life that gives glory to God. 
Now, Paul says, because we've died with him, and because we've been raised with him with this new power to live for his glory, we need to begin to live as though this has taken place, because it has taken place. He says in verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, count on this reality because this is a true thing. You are dead to sin, but alive to God. Now, we need to ask the question, why would he say this? Why would he say we need to do this? Why would he command us to do this? If our corruption, if our sin was completely destroyed, well, it's because it wasn't, okay? Uh, on the cross, it was crucified with Christ. The old man was crucified, but it's still alive. It's wounded. It's dying. In principle, it's completely done away with, and one day it will die completely, and that's the day that the Lord takes us to be with Him in heaven. And by the way, that is a day we should be looking forward to. But in the meantime, it still can, and it does exert a strong influence in our lives, which is why we need to consider ourselves dead to it. But again, when we were raised with Christ, the Spirit put another desire within our hearts. He put within our hearts that love. You know, not just love in general. I, I love the trees, I love the flowers, and, you know, I, I love you, you love me, but, but a specific love for holiness, for holiness. Now, I've said this before, but it bears repeating, and I think until we begin to apprehend this, it's really not going to do us any good, but Jonathan Edwards said this, the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever is that the believer loves holiness, the unbeliever does not. The believer loves God, the believer loves Christ, the believer loves God's Word, the believer loves his, his law, he loves his worship, he loves his people, and he loves them because of the holiness that, that is theirs, you know, the holiness of God. God made us a holy people. This is what believers desire, and they pursue these things because these things are holy, because they love holiness. But the unbeliever doesn't love these things and so does not pursue these things. What the unbeliever loves is the world. And so the unbeliever pursues the world. Now, you can see the difference in the way these two groups live. Those who are truly born again pursue the Lord. Those who are not pursue the world. Now, it's this love for holiness that the Spirit of God gives us when He makes us alive, when He regenerates us, that actually breaks the chain and frees us from this sin. Because all we wanted at one time was sin. That was the only desire in our hearts. And think about this in, in terms of free will. Yes, we have free will. We have the freedom to choose what we want. But at one time, being in bondage to sin, all we wanted was sin. And so we were the slaves of sin. But now we also want holiness. Now we have two desires within our souls. And since we have two desires, we are faced with a choice. Which one are we going to obey? Well, that's why Paul says, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We need to choose righteousness. We need to choose obedience. He tells us we must not let sin control our lives. Now that we've been set free, don't give ourselves again over to its power. Now, we will be tempted, you know, especially because we have corruption in us. That means we are still temptable. And we will be tempted in those areas where we are the weakest, where we are the most vulnerable. You know, Satan is not an idiot. His demons are not an idiot. Even our flesh, that corruption that is within us, it still knows our weakest point, And it's going to attack us right there. But Paul says we mustn't give in. We mustn't carry out our sinful desires. Instead, he says, we need to adopt this mindset, this new mindset, this new way of looking at things, that we died with Christ and we were buried. So think of yourself already having, you know, lived and died and your body is buried somewhere in a, in a cemetery, but God raised you up from the dead, you know, and now you're alive again. You know, put yourself in that mindset.
but He raised you for a specific purpose that you might now live only for Him, that you might take your bodies, which He has given to each one of us, that we might take them and use them as instruments of righteousness rather than the instruments of sin. Paul tells us we can do this. We have the power to do this because we are no longer under law, but under grace. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that when we are under the law to be justified or condemned, when we were without Christ and without God's grace in the state of nature, we were under the law to either be justified or condemned. Our acceptance with God depended on our ability to keep that law. But the problem was we couldn't keep the law. We were spiritually dead. We were unconverted. We were still the slaves of sin. That's all we wanted to do. And the law could not help us because it couldn't give us the power to obey. All it could do was condemn us to death, to eternal death. But now that we're under grace, we do have the power to do what God calls us to do because we have this new desire. We're no longer under the law and powerless, but now we are under grace and we have the power of the Spirit of God working this love within our hearts. Now, this raises a second objection from the Jews. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And what, they mean, what he means by this or what the Jews meant by this is if we're no longer under the law and to be judged by the law, to be justified by the law, if we are acceptable to God through the gift of Jesus' righteousness received by faith, then does it really matter how we live? Now that's, by the way, th this is a very familiar idea, isn't it? I mean, I went to a college that was filled with people like this. This is what the professors were teaching. This is what antinomians believe. Those who are, you know, the word antinomian, namos means law, anti means against. They're against the law. And they think the law was for the legal state of the Jews. And now that we're in the new covenant under grace, we don't, we don't need the law. This is what they believe. Since, again, our justification, our acceptance depends entirely on what Jesus did then it doesn't really matter what we do. It doesn't matter whether we obey or not, and some of them went so far as to say, as I've said on numerous occasions, you can even devote your life to destroy the church and to destroy the kingdom of heaven, but if you have believed, then you're still going to heaven. See, that's how bad it gets. But that's, that's the objection that Paul now addresses. So how does he answer it? First of all, he denounces that position in the strongest possible way. May it never be. Don't even think. May it never even you know, enter your mind or come into existence. This is not the way that it is. He goes on to say this. If we consistently disobey, then we are still the slaves of sin. We haven't really been set free. So what do you, how do you make sense of the person who goes forward at an altar call, you know, which, which we don't have because, again, that's not a biblical concept, they pray the sinner's prayer. You believe, they believe that they've been converted, but nothing changes in their lives and they continue to go the same direction they were going before or maybe they continue for a short time and then they drop off. Well, they're still the slaves of sin, okay? But he says if that is the case in verse 16, if we are still the slaves of sin, then the consequence of sin is still going to be ours and that is death eternal death, you know, um, death in, in hell. But on the other hand, if we consistently obey, this shows that we are the, the slaves of righteousness, that we belong to God, and that we will live eternally. Now, John tells us the same thing. This isn't something that just Paul teaches, but John summarizes it very well in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Little children... Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. You see, the reason why Jesus came into the world was to free us from the dominion of Satan. Satan. 
If we still practice sin, we are still under His dominion. But if we practice righteousness, then we are the slaves of righteousness. You know, John also says in the same chapter, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. The one who practices righteousness is born of God. The one who practices sin is of the devil. Paul's saying the same thing. The one who practices sin is a slave to sin. The one who practices righteousness is a slave of righteousness or a slave of Christ. Paul then concludes with a final exhortation to be careful whom you obey. He says, consider where each of these paths will lead you, where each of these masters, you know, where you're going to end up. When we disobey the Lord, he says, what happens? Well, it leads to further disobedience. I mean, you know that to be the case, don't you? If you give in to sin, it makes it a whole lot easier to give in to sin the next time. It creates what we would call a vicious circle, a downward spiral. But when we obey the Lord, what happens? It leads to further obedience, a virtuous circle, an, an upward spiral. Paul then asks the question, you know, what do we really have to gain by sinning? When you think back on what you've done that's wrong, it's contrary to God's will, aren't you ashamed? He says. And what is the outcome of those things? Isn't it death? But when we obey, what do we gain? The very thing that the true believer wants more than anything else, and that is sanctification, holiness, Christ-likeness. Paul says these things lead to eternal life. Now, again, we have to make sure we understand what Paul is saying here. He's not, saying, he's not replacing the Ten Commandments with a new law. Just obey the Lord now and you'll go to heaven. We don't receive heaven because we obey, because we take this path, because we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. We surrender to the Lordship of Christ, we take this path, we obey because heaven is already in our hearts through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God working His grace through us. This is how we know that we belong to Him. So Paul concludes with this last verse that we often use, I think, in evangelism, and rightly so. For the wages of sin is death. If we choose to practice sin, if we choose to submit to sin and make it our master, then this is what we can expect to receive in return, death, eternal death. But he says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we trust Him instead, if we are under grace and we show that we are through our obedience, our willing obedience, our loving obedience, because this is what we want, then we can expect to receive eternal life. Again, let's not forget, it is the gift of God. Salvation is given to us entirely freely of God's grace. We are justified by grace through faith alone. But Paul is not you know, letting us off, as it were, the antinomian. You know, he's not allowing us to go in that direction. It still matters how we live because how we live shows whether we truly are united with Christ or not. Do we really love Him? Do we really love righteousness? It will show in whom we serve. Now, with, with that in mind, as we prepare to come to the table, we really do need to ask ourselves this question. Who is it that we are serving? Are we the slaves of Christ or are we the slaves of sin? Well, if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, He has, as, again, as we've been reminded in our morning hymn, He has cut through the chains that bound us and we are free and we use that freedom to serve Him. Again, not perfectly. That's the reason why Paul says we need to consider ourselves dead to sin. Why would he say that if nobody's struggling with temptation to sin? No, you're dead to those things and you're now alive to serve God. Okay? If, if that is what you're doing, fighting against your sin and living the life God calls you to live, then this, this table reminds you that Jesus is the one who set you free. And he is also the one who will continue to nurture that grace in your heart to give you the strength to do this um, even more fully, to, to sanctify you. But again, if those chains haven't been broken, 
as evidenced by, by the way you live. If, if you're giving yourself to sin, to practice sin, you're still the slave of sin, you need to come to Christ before you would come to the table. So with that in mind, let's, um, let's just bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, help us search our hearts to see where we're at and um, then either participate or abstain as, we, uh, as, as He shows us. So let's, let's pray.